If you would like to support the channel, then please turn off adblock and refresh the page. Alternatively, use the link in the description below to donate to T1 Patreon. Thank you. Hello Magic Community on YouTube, I'm T1 Glistener Elf, here with an updated deck tech for you. I have run a Black Moon deck uh, quite a number of times on this channel. What, a couple dozen now? But the deck has evolved over time. And so, here's my updated version of the deck. You'll note that it goes from a mid-range deck to certainly a control deck. So when I say Black Moon, this Black Moon deck, that means that we run Blood Moon in here. So this is, exa <laughs> this is exactly as frustrating for people as you would imagine it is. It's in the main board before decks have most decks have a chance to prepare against it. This just turns their non-basics into mountains. Now, Blood Moon itself is an interesting card in, in a metagame call, because the more developed the meta is, the better Blood Moon gets. If you're just going over to your local FNM, and people are coming in with their new decks, and they have a bunch of basics in them, well then you're not going to get as much out of Blood Moon, because those aren't the decks that get punished. We're talking about those greedy mana bases. We're talking about Junt and Absent or Junk. We're talking about uh, Ad Nauseum combo. Well, they can get past it. We're talking about Infect. In any case, uh, Blood Moon just wrecks a lot of main boards by virtue of its being there, but it's only a two of. Uh, there's a reason for that. Even I think the fewest I've ever seen a Blue Moon deck play is two. And that's because they have a lot of draw power. They can actually get away with that to a certain extent. They run their Serum Visions, they run their Cryptic Commands, their Remands. They're trying to draw into that Blood Moon. Our deck doesn't have that affordance. We can't simply just rely on draw power because in this deck, at least in its current incarnation, we don't really have any. And so what I'm running instead, is it's a control shell that happens to have an Oops I Win button in Blood Moon. And there are two copies, so the odds are, it's something just shy of 50%, I think, for us to find it by turn 3, to find at least one copy. That's fine, the rest of the deck works well enough, and we do stall quite a lot in this strategy. And let me show you our control elements here. We start off with four hand attack spells, either Inquisition of Kozilek or Thoughtseize. I run Inquisition of Kozilek because, at least in my meta, I, I anticipate a lot more burn, and I don't anticipate a lot of decks that take advantage of the much higher curve. So Inquo, for me, your mileage may vary. You don't have much to do in terms of life gain either. I used to, it used to be easy for me because we lose enough life in this deck, we need Inquisition. But now there's a source of life gain, albeit not too much. We'll get to that in a minute, but... Uh, if you are running that, Thoughtseize may be better for you. It just fights certain combo decks, it hits Ad Nauseam. You get the idea. Uh, because this is a red deck, we run Lightning Bolt. <laughs> we could use the removal. It's easy enough. Now, this is the kind of deck that uh, it will not win off of the burn play. It won't win quickly. And so I've actually considered, although I don't think this is right, not running Lightning Bolt, but instead running Flame Slash for that extra one point of damage. It's sorcery speed and it can't hit players, but we're very rarely hitting other players anyway. If we are hitting players, then we've probably already won the game. We use this just to control the ground, and Flame Slash at least does four damage. But I still think it's worth it to be able to play Lightning Bolt because it's an instant and so we can do shenanigans at the end of their turn, which is important against decks like Infect, for instance, where we can force them to use protection on their creatures or Vines of Asswood on their turn and on our turn, and often that just overtaxes them. Next we run Dismember. We can actually play it, and this gives us something... <laughs> well, what I mean by that is we can pay the... Uh, Phyrexian mana or actual mana, either way. So that we don't have to, but since we can, we might as well. And this gives us something else to do in the early game against low to the ground decks like Burn or Infect. Well, if you're doing that against Burn, you're doing their job for them too. That's not a great example. Like Zoo or Infect or sometimes Affinity. Uh, so that's why we run Dismember. It just gives us some early kill spell. 
we run three terminates, and maybe this should be four, but I'm not sure what to take out for the fourth one. But it is a great removal spell. The no regen clause comes up in my meta more often than it probably should, thanks to Varols and um, Lutlatrol, because we have a Varols combo player in our meta. Uh, but it's certainly a, you know, again, it's instant speed, just outright destroys the creature, it's two mana. I mean, why not, right? Next we have four Kologons Command. This does it all. <laughs> it gets us a creature back, adds it to our hand, makes them discard a card, destroys an artifact, so shatters, and it shocks. So this kind of just does everything. Oftentimes, though, the modes that I will end up picking are two damage and make them discard a card, which is sort of the least exciting version of it, I think. Now that I'm running more creatures, returning a creature to hand might actually be where it's at. I love that I'm running four main board artifact hate cards in that as well. The affinity match for this deck is actually better than you might think because we're controlling the ground a lot and we have uh, Kologon's command and Blood Moon is not really... W I mean, I'm citing it out. It does something in the match uh, but it's generally very little. It uh, pretty much just stops Thoughtcast. <laughs> That's now I know Master of Ethereum is seeing more play, and it does something there, and they have Springleaf Drum to get around that. Still, Blood Moon is what we take out, and don't worry, we have some great replacements. Uh, I run two Anger of the Gods, just nice mass removal. It's three, so it hits Zoo decks, and that's where we want to be. Pyroclasm does not, and Zoo is one of the matches about which I worry most running this deck. That's why we run Anger. Now, I'm running Languish. For two reasons. Firstly, I have given up on the notion that I am ever going to own Damnation. Sad but true. But secondly, it's a conditional mass removal spell, a conditional wrath, and we actually take advantage of the fact that it's only minus four minus four because we happen to run four copies of... you guessed it. It's not Tassiker because we're not running blue or green in the stack. Instead, it's Gurmog Angler. It's the zombie fish. That art. Ugh. Yeah, so the fact that we can play a one mana 5-5, five five, well, I mean, not really one mana, but let's face it, one mana 5-5 five five is kind of awesome in this deck. It's really where we want to be. Just gets past Languish, gets past Anger of the Gods, beats or eats Reality Smasher, it'll trade with Smasher. Uh, there's a lot in this format that Gurmog Angler will work against. Uh, and it's too big for Lightning Bolt, not too big for Dismember, but you can't win <laughs> You can't win them all, I guess. Gives us a creature to get back with Kologon's Command. This is a control dex creature, I would say. Just you know, control the board during the early game, stick the Gurmog Angler, and keep swinging with it. I run two Fulminator Mages. More land destruction. These can be brought back with Kologon's Command, which gets kind of gruesome, kind of ugly <laughs> for the opponent, because Kologon's Command, Fulm well, Fulminator Mage, sack, destroy, land, Kologon's Command to get it back, do it again, potentially do it again. Fulminator Mage can just help to break the control mirror, which is where I find it the most helpful. Next, I run a one of Kalidus Trader of Get. Okay, so... This is, this is the replacement for Koth of the Hammer, which I had been running for some time. Koth did not really get the job done. He doesn't generate a lot of red mana for me because I have a lot of swamps and a fair number of non-swamp, non-mountain, so it doesn't give me that much mana. The emblem suffers from the same, and he can't really protect himself with his plus. So Kalidus, on the other hand, is a 3-4 wall with lifelink. This gives us something to do against the burn match. And it gives me a reward for destroying all of their creatures. I get two two zombies that for some reason don't come in tapped. And I can make him bigger. So, yeah, one of the issues with Kalidus is he's within Languish range. But you can use his last ability to get him out of Languish range. Which is also very nice. And I guess worst case scenario you could sack an Angler to it. But usually you're just going to sack one of their tokens that they're giving you. Uh, that's always nice. Just as a one of though, because it's a legend, and it's not so good that I need more. I run a one of Olivia Voldaren, 
because I like taking control of my opponent's creatures in the late game. We can get to the late game enough. She pokes, which helps against a few decks, especially Infect, so the one damage is relevant. And against the bigger decks, say Jund and Junk, I can just take their creatures outright. Take your Siege Rhino, for instance. Unfortunately, she does die to Anger, she does die to Languish, but like Kalidus, she can get herself out of that range fairly readily, so the only creature that really has to worry about our mass removal is Fulminator Mage, who also just gets sacrificed anyway, so we're trying to make our Anger of the Gods and Languish as asymmetrical as we possibly can while still being able to play these creatures. But you know what definitely doesn't have to worry about Wrath Spells? Planeswalkers. We've run a one of Chandra, Pyromaster, and all of the Planeswalkers in this deck are one ofs because they're effectively legendary, and again, none of them break the back of our opponents on their own. I'm also a huge fan of Singleton Theory, running a bunch of one ofs uh, to mess with our opponent's hate package. What are they going to bring in against us? Well, they don't know because what they see in this game may not be the same as what they see in the next game. But on to Chandra herself. Uh, hit, she's removal. She's not only removal against low creatures, you know, low to the ground creatures, but if they only have one creature, well, we can keep swinging through regardless. Um, getting the one damage from Chandra, plus Gurmog Angler or whatever else is going on. Uh, she's also virtual card advantage with her zero. Exile a card, I get to play that card this turn. So in a deck that doesn't have a lot of draw power, she gives me some draw power. And then lastly, you know, I haven't ever really gone crazy with her minus seven because this deck doesn't have a lot of burn spells, for instance, to be able to finish the opponent off that way. Um, you could use it effectively as a mass removal spell if she hits Dismember or Terminate or Kuligon's Command, but really, if you can use the minus seven and hit Lightning Bolt, well, that's that's pretty great. So, let's see, that ends up being... Uh, copy it three times, so nine damage or six with Kuligon's Command. Not enough to really break their backs. You use her as light removal and card advantage, which this deck sorely, sorely needs. The next is a bit unusual. You're thinking, well, this is an on color for Liliana of the Veil. Not the anorexic Liliana. <laughs> Liliana of the Dark Realms actually serves a decent purpose in this deck that Veil just will not serve. With her plus, she goes and gets us Swamps, which we are running a Blood Moon deck, so we need Swamps. We need She doesn't just get basic Swamps, it's Swamps, so she can get Blood Crypt. Uh, her minus, of course, is a kill spell, and it's targeted, which has its pros and its cons. Um, and it gets around indestructible, yada yada yada, you get, you get the idea. And we don't ever really use her ult. We don't need the extra mana that much in this deck. We use her, I'll just constantly plus her so that I can keep deck thinning. Liliana of the Veil is not where you want to be in a control deck that doesn't adequately make use of the graveyard. And the reason is because she forces hand disadvantage, right? You use her, that's a minus one, and then every time you use her plus, yeah, your opponent d d discards a card, excuse me, but so do you. And so she maintains that minus one. Now, yes, it is possible that with Gurmog Angler, you are getting some advantage out of that. Kolagon's Command lets you get back a creature if you drop one in the yard. That's true. But odds are, in today's meta, the opponent is getting a lot more out of their graveyard than you are, and so I'm not really comfortable using Lilion of the Veil in this deck. And also, it's the case, I'll admit, Bogles is not a thing in my meta. So I am not running Lilion of the Veil, and I don't worry about Bogles. I have tried out sideboard options against them. If I brought this to a more general meta, I do have some cards I could try, but it's not really something that I need right now. And I don't think Lily is on a, the Veil, anyway, is where I want to be on that front. Now, that being the case, she's cheaper, her ult is actually useful, uh, but I run Dark Realms largely because in control decks, we don't want that kind of asymmetric, or excuse me, symmetrical uh, disadvantage, card disadvantage. And also, her plus does me some good. It goes and gets swamps, um, which help me to break the symmetry of Blood Moon further. So... That's why I'm running her. Feel free to disagree. I've tried her out. She does a lot of work. Um, you know, I, I think that in this particular strategy, she's the better one. It's like when, uh, when people talk about Jace the Mind Sculptor versus, say, Jace Architect of Thought. 
Okay, Jace the Mind Sculptor is the better card, but Jace Architect of Thought can get you Emrakul with his ult. I mean, there are pros and cons. You know, it's not strictly better. And Liliana the Veil versus Dark Realms, Veil is probably still better. I just don't, I'm not convinced yet that she is in this kind of deck. So now that I've gotten over that little spiel, that rant, uh, feel if you disagree with me, that's okay. You can leave that in the comments below and let me know what you think or why you think what you think. The next we're running is a one of Obnixilis Reignited, a win condition planeswalker if we've ever seen one. It's card advantage at the sake of losing some life, which is one of the reasons why I don't run Thoughtseize, even though he's just a one of and he's five mana. Uh, it also destroys creatures, so it helps you to survive in the mid game. And, yeah, the emblem just wins you the game, outright. You are stalling the opponent, you and your opponent will draw enough cards that they will lose the game. It's, it's that simple. Uh, just a nice little win condition. And a faster win condition is Sarkon the Dragon Speaker. Yeah, he wins with his plus. <laughs> He's pretty good, I hear. Um, yeah, so Sarkon is a 4-4... Indestructible, haste, flying, legendary, yada yada yada. He has everything going on in his plus. Oh, and he's a dragon. As if he, as if the rest of it didn't matter. He's a dragon. Um, his minus three is flame slash. So again, like Ob, actually like all of these, he has removal on him as well, and he's just a nice little beater. Just hits for four over and over again. Gets past Bolt, he's indestructible anyway. They need Dismember or Path often just to be able to stop him. Um, yeah, just a, another when I get to the mid or late game, I will win sort of card. He's our Gideon, I guess, in this kind of deck. And it, it's also worth noting that, um, let's see, at the beginning of the end step, you discard your hand with his ult, and so after you've discarded your hand, then the opponent can flash in once you don't have any more removal spells. They can play their instants, they can play their flash creatures. So the ult isn't as good in modern. There, there's Snapcaster Mage, there's Vendillion Click, so on and so forth. Uh, cards that do take use of that. I've never in an actual modern game popped his ult. That being the case, I can see how I might find myself in that situation at some point against, say, a zoo deck, for instance. I might get to that point. And now we get to the land base. So, so you'll notice we have 26 cards in here right now. That means that we're running 24 lands. It's pretty heavy on our lands. We're a control deck that doesn't have re any real draw power. Uh, I have run Shadow of Doubt in here before. Shadow of Doubt was in the Fulminator Mage slot. That may be worth it. Shadow of Doubt, it not only draws us a card, but it stone rains our opponent, potentially, if we use it in response to a fetch. So that's always nice. Players can't search their library, so they can't fetch. Uh, if we're on the play, that is an exceptionally good card. Uh, the Black Black is sometimes an issue. Very rarely, though. You'll see we have mostly lands that generate black mana. Uh, starting off with three Lava Claw Reaches. Uh, this one's a Black Clay Cliffs, but it's supposed to be a Lava Claw Reach. I apologize for that. So three of these, it is a Manland, or a Land Folk, or a Living Volcano. It looks like it has a horse and a rider. I don't know, whatever. This is awesome. Now that I look at it, that art is scary as can be. Dude, that is fucking scary. Pardon my French. Alright, so this is our... This serves the same purpose that Celestial Colonnade does in the Jeskai, or the blue-white, uh, control decks, which is, once we've kept our opponent from being able to do anything, we can just keep beating with our creature over and over again, our land creature. Now, it's a little different for us, because we're having to clear the ground first, and we can do that fairly well with Lightning Bolt, with Dismember, with Terminate, with Colagon's Command, with Anger, with Languish, <laughs> with Olivia, with our Planeswalkers. We can clear the ground fairly well, and Lava Claw Reaches doesn't fly, so it needs that. On the other hand, when you have this many lands in the deck, Lava Claw Reaches, I think the most I've ever swung for was nine with it. Uh, it gets to be huge on the front end. It's a very nice card. A 2-2 normally, but it has ghost fire breathing. So, three of these. It has a little bit of a nombo with Blood Moon, obviously. If we stick the Blood Moon, 
We're hoping to win with our creatures anyway, not Lava Claw Reaches, but we are still a control deck and we only have two Blood Moons. This gives us something to do once the board is cleared. Uh, next we have four Bloodstain Mire, specifically Bloodstain Mire. These will go and get Swamps, but they'll also go and get Mountains, which is important because, as you'll see in just a moment, we have one Mountain in the list. And then the rest, I have... Uh, Black fetches. It doesn't matter what the black fetches are, just black fetches. You have enough swamps that you're going to want uh, to be able to get those swamps more than the mountain. Uh, and I have three verdants and two polluted deltas. It doesn't really matter. I mean, I guess you'd want more diversity. You may want some arid, uh, not arid mesa, uh, oh, uh, why can't it? Marsh flats. There we go, marsh flats. Just so that you can mess with your opponent's pything needles. I guess if you're being optimal, you want to diversify it as much as possible, but most of the time it doesn't really matter. Next, I'm running four Blood Crypts, because obviously, you know, I can fetch for... You, know, you get the idea, I don't really have to explain that one too much if you're familiar with Modern. Uh, I will, however, explain this much. So, obviously these are Shock Lands. You can get away with the Rakdos Tango Land, a Smoldering Marsh, I think it's called. Because you are running seven basics in this list, I don't. I wouldn't suggest that you make all of them uh, Tango Land, Smoldering Marsh. But you don't necessarily have to have four Blood Crypts specifically. There is certainly an advantage to being able to, in the late game, once you have the basics established, not having to worry about whether you're going to need to pay life or not. So, yes, I think I would actually go to three Blood Crypts and one Smoldering Marsh. I actually don't own Smoldering Marsh, but maybe that's right? I don't know, I'd like to hear what you think about it. We run, as you saw earlier, six basic swamps. Shoutouts to being snow covered. I dig it. Just like the art. It doesn't really matter that it's snow. Maybe you can trick your opponent a little bit by making them debate, okay, what snow strategy are they running? Um, so there's that. That's true. And then Mountain. This one is not snow covered because I like the art. I am 13 years old, and that is funny to me. Shoutouts to Georgia O'Keefe. <laughs> I guess. I mean, shoutouts to Noah Bradley, but shoutouts to Georgia O'Keefe as well. Alright, someone will get that. And then, one gemstone caverns. What are you doing in this deck? So, if this is in our opening hand, and we are on the draw, then we can basically play this as a ley line, essentially. You put it out on the field, it's uh, you know, just played on turn zero, I guess, and it gets a luck counter, but you have to exile a card in order to put the luck counter on it. Now normally it just generates colored mana, or a colorless mana, but it generates mana of any color if it has a luck counter on it. And what we use this for is rushing out the Blood Moon on turn two. Essentially, this card reads, if your opponent would go first, and this is in the opening hand, you actually kind of went first. It's oversimplifying it a bit, but you, you get the idea. This enables me to play the Blood Moon a little bit more quickly, while not actually having any true ramp in the deck. It's only using up a land slot. This is also a control deck, of course, and so getting to my higher curve is where, I, I guess it's where I need to be, right? So, this just enables me to get there a little bit more readily at a very, very, very low opportunity cost. I find. Now, you also can put any card on it. It doesn't have to be a land or a non-land. Just remove a card. So, Gemstone Caverns is nice for that. I've actually even tried it out in Legacy before. In a, uh, I've had it as a one-of in Death and Taxes. By the way, one-of because it's legendary. Uh, I had it as a one-of in Death and Taxes specifically for turn one, turn two combo decks in the format so that I had the ability to get out Thalia on my first turn. That's the main reason why I did that. And it never came up, at least as far as I remember, but that was the logic behind it. I think this is a criminally underrated card in Modern and in Legacy for the low, low cost of one of your land slots and most of the time generating colorless mana. And so with that all being in the main board, here comes the sideboard. I run a 1 of Grim Lavamancer for repeatable low-to-the-ground removal. 
just being able to shock the opponent or their creatures, usually their creatures, over and over again is nice, of course. I'm going to set the... right here. Uh, next, I have a one of Night of Souls Betrayal. <laughs> this is for tokens, to a large extent, although their intangible virtue does effectively counter this. Uh, this gives me something to do against their creatures getting too big for me and the clock just being abrasive. Also, if I can make it to the late enough game against Infect, this outright wins the game against them, because Glistener Elf, Blighted Agent, Ink Moth Nexus, Noble Hierarch, None of them have toughness greater than one, and they can't even save them with pump spells because state-based actions kick in before they would even have a chance to cast said pump spell. So that's very nice, of course. Uh, well, nice for me. I, as an Infect main, maybe I over-prioritize Infect, but it's one of those decks that forces you to take it into consideration when you're building your own deck. You, you have to, ultimately, because they're so low to the ground, they're so fast, but they're interactive, so they don't break modern, they only break your deck if you don't prepare for them. Uh, next, we have three Nile Spell Bombs for Graveyard Hate that also draws us a card, just cycles. We want to keep our own graveyard so we don't run Relic of Progenitus, uh, but at the same time, it's better than Tormod's Crypt because we're on color for it so we can use it to draw a card. Let me do it this way so that the name is still visible while I'm going about it. And next we have more graveyard hate. It's, it's miscellaneous hate. We have Rakdos Charm. You see why I say that our affinity match is awesome. We have so many spot removal spells in the main, and Kolagon's Command, and we can bring in Rakdos Charm, and we're not even done yet. So exile all cards from target player's graveyard, some more graveyard hate, or destroy target artifact, or each creature deals one damage to its controller. If my opponent tries to haphazardly go off with Kiki Resto or something, then we can use this to outright kill them. <laughs> That's possible. That's always fun, I suppose. Uh, usually, though, players that play those strategies often enough, especially when it's Resto and they don't have to make a million creatures, will just make exactly as many as they need, but it's something that we can do. Uh, it's my miscellaneous hate card. Uh, and it, it works wonders, as you can see. Next, we have Shatterstorm, because affinity. I swear, if this deck does not have the best affinity match of any control deck you've ever seen, it is unfortunate. They, I, would I would love to see what other deck has a better match against them. Uh, we run two Sudden Shocks. I bring this in against Infect, and I also bring this in against Snapcaster Mage decks. You know, if they're Snapcaster, Vendillion, Click Delver, that sort of thing. I just get the ability to kill off all of their creatures without their being able to counter it. So easy enough. Next, my Burn Hate package. Two Sun Droplets. This can be too slow, admittedly. If you stick this on turn two, take damage on their turn, and then just keep killing off their creatures, well then this will hopefully get you back into the game well enough. It's two mana for gain a great deal of life. The longer the game goes on, the more it will gain. Uh, I don't know what the record is for me, but when you get two sun droplets out, you can actually net mana, or not net mana, net life off of that. Wunderbar, I guess. And lastly, a Vandal Blast. <laughs> Yeah, you thought I was done hating on Affinity. No, 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 no. No, in all seriousness. Uh, it's it's a bad match for us going into game one, so we have a lot. And we might as well bring it in against them. We want to make that as clean of a match as we can. Um, yeah, this is, this is what I'm rocking. This is what I'm running. I hope that you enjoy it. If you have any suggestions, feel more than free to let me know and I would be happy to do what I can. I'll, I'll ha be happy. This is the second version of the deck. This is my updated one. It's certainly different enough that I think it merits its own deck tech, its own uh, separate guide for you, and you have plenty of games. Uh, there should be a card up here somewhere. Plenty of games of me piloting both the old version of this deck and the new one. Uh, also, I should note, even though his deck is now different than mine, uh, shoutouts to Total MTG, 
I know you're watching this because you like this kind of deck. I know it, I know it, I know it, I know it. Um, he doesn't run Blood Moon, he runs Pack Rat. And that changes a lot about this deck. If you're not running Blood Moon, well then your mana base doesn't need this many basics, uh, and you can afford to play more Black Cleave Cliffs, you can play whatever the Glacial Fortress is for Rakdos colors, the Buddy Land for these colors. You don't have to... You, you, it changes the way that the deck runs because you're not trying to lock the opponent down and then just stall, stall, stall uh, in quite the same way. Instead, you turn into a mid-range deck. So a creature that I like in that strategy, if you want to, if you aren't running this type of deck, if you want to run something more similar to the old version, I am a huge fan of Vampire uh, Gatekeeper of Malakir. There we go. Not Vampire Hex Mage. <laughs> that, that, I guess, could go in there to fight walkers, maybe? Uh, but Gatekeeper of Malakir is the Liliana of the Veil of that type of deck. Uh, just m makes them sacrifice a creature. It's an Edict on a 2-2 body. And because of Blood Moon not being in the deck... Sorry about the... Whoa! <laughs> sorry. So, so sorry. Um, because Blood Moon's not in the deck, you don't have to worry about uh, shutting down your own lands and not being able to pay black, black, black for it. So anyway, that's it for right now. I will see you later. Take care. Bye-bye.